Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses, a podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Hey folks, we just wanted to give a shout out and and a thank you for uh, watching the episodes and subscribing and then uh, also remind you of the benefits of hitting that subscription or subscribe button down below. Present our case to our subs- to our sponsors, and with that, we give basically everything we get from our sponsors. We give back to you as as audience. So, yeah. So if you if you don't mind, hit that subscribe button. You're going to get notifications of new episodes and other benefits from that. So again. We want to leave you with a big thank you for uh, watching and supporting the uh, Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbass Show. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Nose Jammer contains vanillin and other natural aromatic compounds that have the ability to effectively jam an animal's sense of smell. Just like an overly bright light can wash out a photographic image, Nose Jammer overwhelms the olfactory system and overpowers an animal's ability to detect and track human scent. Hunting in the wrong wind? Jam them with Nose Jammer. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors with Two Dumb Asses. Uh, we are we are in uh, rural Iowa right now, and uh, we have a very special guest, Joel. Uh, before we get into that, uh, what have you been up to? You know, I was uh, talking before we started rolling. Uh, I've been on the boat the last three days. My brother came down and three days of fishing. So uh, a lot of boat time and not too many uh, not too many fish in the boat, but it was fun. We caught some catfish and my first experience with a freshwater drum. Really? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> which is a carp basically yeah, right yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. sheephead they call them sheepheads uh-huh. but freshwater drum sounds better and uh so we actually did a little research on that and tried cooking one up so uh, there's potential there you know i heard they're great smoked actually i think anything's great smoked right <laughs> uh but uh we we actually they're they're really firm and and white meat and you just got to be careful and trim off the the blood meat on them so okay. uh, more to come on that Okay. But that's what uh, I've been doing this week. Yeah, I'm hoping I don't catch a lot of drums so that we can continue down that path, just FYI. Yeah, we caught some catfish, <laughs> so we had a little bit of eating. But uh, I'm glad I don't have to survive on what I catch. It'll okay. 100 pounds lighter, I know that. <laughs> Gosh, what have I been up to? Uh, so we've been having a lot of rain down where we where we live. And uh, so it washed out uh, one of my creek crossings. So I have my tractor. It's kind of stranded across the creek crossing. There's... There's really no way for me to get my tractor safely back. Um, so I've got uh, Josh from JD uh, Bulldozing and Excavation coming out tomorrow uh, to look what we're going to do to fix that. Um, I've been mowing my CRP. I've got my um, second mowing done. I'm going to end up having to do a third mowing. I hate to admit it. And uh, and then the last thing is that I got the N- NRCS coming out. Uh, tomorrow to inspect my CP42 field. So that's pretty much what I've been doing. But uh, enough about us. You yeah. know, hey, yeah. we, we've got a really special guest with us. Um, Terry, um, why don't you t- t- uh, talk a little bit about yourself, give an introduction, and uh, who you represent? Sure. So, um, Terry Sadovic. And so uh, I, uh, I represent was mid-Iowa QDMA. Um, we now um, switched everything over to National Deer Association. Um, and so uh, there's been a big change with them over this last year, you know, based on all the COVID impacts and those types of things. Uh, some of these nonprofits had to get much smarter and, and more efficient, and that's kind of what they've done. Um, so uh, I started this chapter probably, it's probably been 10 or 12 years, I guess, already. Wow. And you know, like most chapters, and I think a lot of people experience this, is they, they get a group of guys together and they start up a chapter and it's a blast for about two, three years and there's a lot of work involved and it comes down to there's a couple of guys left and just keep the chapter afloat. And so I've been able to do that. Um, 
Uh, we've done some really great things uh, as the National Deer Association has done their merger. It's, uh, uh, it's been great, but they still have the same QDMA philosophies and so forth. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a good change and so far. And it's kind of what I've been doing a little bit with them. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, for our listeners, you know, from this point on, we'll refer to QDMA as NDA yeah. uh, in our episode, just, yeah. to, just to be clean. Um, so with that... Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the mission of NDA? Sure. So with NDA, um, you know, they, they brought on a lot of the same mission statements and the same goals as, you know, previously QDMA was doing, um, where they were really conservation driven, a lot of educational type stuff. Uh, and the main purpose was, is to really help, um, you know, small landowners to big landowners to manage their deer herds better. And I think the best way to do that is through education of, you know, whether it's um, your buck to doe ratio, it's uh, nutrition, it's um, all of those types of things. And, um, you know, it, it contributes to your your own little hunting philosophies to kind of to that type of stuff. And so um, the mission is, is, is really that educational piece, the conservation piece. And it's not just to educate just the hunters on how they can do better with their properties and, and, and hunting that type of stuff, but it's to educate the non-hunters on really what a conservative conservationist is. Um, that, you know, we're more than just killing the animals and what that means for us all. It's, it's, it's deeper than that, whether it's the heritage of hunting with your kids, uh, the, the meat that you get and that we use the meat, that we're not just shooting stuff and leaving it lay, that there's more to the whole experience than in just out shooting the animal. Um, and so there's a piece to that that I do like, that they do try to help educate the non-hunters. Uh, it's a little bit deeper than that. So um, that's kind of been their mission and those types of things and, and grow the knowledge of conservation. That's really great. You know, I as you're sitting talking, uh, um you know, hunters really are some of the biggest conservationists yeah. out there. And it's a misnomer. And uh, um, I bring this up is, is that we had a post out there and uh, we had a gal who is a vegetarian for 47 years. <laughs> and uh, she went on, she went on three pages of a rant uh, oh. talking about how, uh, how uh, horrible of a person hunters are yep. or hor- horrible people, excuse me. And, uh, and I was very professional, you know, I, I uh, tried to explain to her, you know, what what we've done and uh, she would have none of it. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, but I think the important thing is, is for people to understand, and I think most of our listeners do, is we put a ton of money into the environment, into the soil, into um, ecology of, of uh, for habitat for animals. I mean, right. I mean, and licenses pay for. A lot of that so if you didn't Absolutely. have if you didn't have hunters things would be in a lot worse shape yeah there's definitely that that misnomer and there's you know there's some special people out there that don't want to think of it any other way but i mean we talked a little bit early on when you guys first got here as you looked at our property it's you know it, if i wanted to just sit in a tree stand and shoot one deer for the meat i'd put a salt block out but as you look out over our deck we've got acres and acres of food plots and conservation and habitat um there's a lot of effort that goes into all those types of things that uh if i wasn't doing that for the nutrition and the balance of the deer that are out here it, there's a much easier process than, than the, what we do sure. you know there's a lot of money invested in it and a lot of you know thought process and doing that so um and it's not just me. You see that all over with, with, with hunters that if they've got land, they're trying to do the best thing they can for that deer herd um, so that they can be the most nutritionally balanced as they can be. And, you know, and that's how you keep disease at bay, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the, the animals that are going to get sickest the first are those are the ones that are, you know, the healthy. Right. Yeah. right. Right. And it's, uh, you know, and I'll go back a little bit to, you know, one of the studies that we've always tried to look at is, is that doe to buck ratio. Um, cause it's easy for, um, for that to get out of whack. If, if you're not thinning out some of that deer herd, some of those does every year, uh, it creates a huge imbalance where the, now you have so many deer, 
fighting for the same nutrition, they're getting less nutrition, they, they converge more into one location, which creates more of a disease transition across the herd. And so we've always tried to maintain that balance. And so, you know, we talked a lot about it. we have cameras all over the place. It's not just to see the pictures of the giant bucks out there, which is obviously a bonus if you get one on there. But it's, we use that to kind of balance where are all the dirt, all the does coming. Uh, so we kind of see, you know, we kind of get a head count. You can kind of tell, you know, from a non-hunter's perspective, they all look the same. From someone that hunts a lot, you can look at a camera picture and sometimes you know the same doe. You, you know one doe from a different doe. Right? Half the time you've given them a name, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> we've even, last year, we even went as far as we had a couple does that we knew so well that we named them. So, you know, most guys are naming their giant bucks. We'll name an occasional doe because some of them are, you know, they, they've got their own unique traits to them. So yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, hey. Go ahead. I was just going to ask a question yeah. around the, the chapter. Piece. Yeah. So um, NDA, is this something that has an annual fee? Do you just you join or what does that look like, Terry? Right. So you join. Um, it's it's like a lot of the other ones out there, like Whitetail Institute has theirs and the, all those types of uh, organizations. And so you can go out to their website, nationaldeerassociation.com, and you can sign up and join as a member. And then you'll start getting good information. I mean, you get... Uh, some periodicals. You'll get four periodicals a year. Uh, you get the email blasts, which give a lot of educational stuff. I mean, some quick tips and stuff based on what seasons are coming up. And so you get something for your money. And then if there's a chapter, all the chapters do their banquets, those types of things. And I, you realize they're money makers because that's how these organizations survive, right? But don't overlook the camaraderie that you get when you go to these banquets. Because, you know, um, as much as I put some of these banquets on and it's a time, it's a time suck and it, you know, it can be a pain, but I don't, I don't regret doing them because those evenings create such camaraderie with people I haven't met with just discussions of hunting, that type of stuff. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of that going on. And so, um, yeah, join the, you can go up and join the, the association. You get a lot of good information. Uh, and those, those groups all need that. I mean, you don't want these types of groups to go away. Sure, that's right. Yeah, and we'll include that information in the in the podcast yeah. here, yeah, the episode. Absolutely. That'd be great. Be good. I gotta check that out. Yeah, so I, I want to come back to yeah. uh, buck to doe ratios. So yes, you've mentioned that a couple times. Yeah. Um, what is I've I mean I've read done my own research, but what's the ideal buck to doe ratio? Well, we've always gone with the ideal buck to doe ratio is about twelve to fifteen does per one buck. Um, it's kind of what you're looking for. And there's no way to scientifically, you know, narrow that down. There's no study that can really uh -huh. narrow that down. But that's kind of what you're looking for, you know, on a good day when you're seeing a field full of deer, you do a kind of a good head count and that type of stuff. Um, now, where I live, I live up up by Sailorville Lake area, and um, uh, I used to take does up there all the time because at one point, uh, and I've worked with the DNR officers in all those locations to kind of get their perspective because they'll share with you i mean don't hesitate to reach out to your dnr officer they've got good data and good knowledge and those guys are always willing to share you know that type of stuff um but like the the buck to doe ratio at one point up in sailorville lake area was like 75 does to one buck wow. it was just out of control and you had all the residential areas that were growing around there so you've got all of the 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 city slickers were moving out there because they want to be part of the country but they didn't want the deer shot and it just gets out of hand at some point. So all the public ground that was out there being hunted stopped being hunted because of all the publicity of, hey, we don't want people hunting out here because nobody wants the deer dying in their backyard. Well, you get a, you get a bad mix at that point of, of, of a doe to buck ratio. But we've done some studies on various properties where I've helped some people out where I'll put up a bunch of cameras on some of the main feeding areas and we'll try to do our best guess of what that doe to buck ratio is. And you come out and walk away from that saying, okay, you need to take out so many does this year in certain locations, and, and, and you do that, so you focus on that. Um, and it, we've seen huge increases in, that, in, in the nutrition of the deer. Um, one of the side effects of that also is you'll start seeing more bucks. So if, if, if there's so many does to the buck, the buck doesn't have to travel that far to get to a doe. And so when you've got that doe to buck ratio in the right perspective of 12 to 15 to one, you'll actually find that they'll come into calls more frequently during rut season 
because they now have to look for a doe. They have to chase for a doe. And so there's a lot of different side effects to it all, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fine balance. <laughs> I'm sure it takes time to, to change that ratio. What, what could people yeah. expect? Probably two to five years to, yeah. to start changing that? Yeah, there was a property that I helped manage um, out by Earlham, Iowa, where he had about 1,000 acres. And when I first went out there, and my best guess is he was probably at 35 to 40 does per buck. Uh, and we, we essentially, he got some, uh, some tags from the DNR, some extra tags from the DNR to clean out does. And we were probably taking out probably 10 to 12 does out of there a year. And we went a couple of years without taking a single buck. And after about three to five years, you just saw a nice balance and a nice change where, yeah, you didn't see as many does, but the, you saw a lot more mature bucks come in there and you saw the health of the animals a lot better. Um, I mean, we were seeing when we first went out there, you'd see bucks that were, you know, average in size, maybe a little bit smaller, but they were fighting for food. Like with it, with all the does. I mean, there'd be times you'd go stand, stand in one of their clover fields, maybe a five acre clover field, and there'd be 40 does in that field. Wow. Just insane. Wow. Um, to where we, you know, when we were, after about five years or so, you'd see a really good change in the health and the nutrition of the deer where they were all putting on really good weight. Um, but it took some conservative efforts to pass on bucks and just shoot a bunch of does. So, you know, if, uh, you know, as I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm reflecting on my own property, I think I got the right buck to doe ratio, right? I think I have a population problem, right? Yeah. So, because you brought that up and I, you know, when I start to look at, I mean, there's a field where when I'm hunting, I might see 20, 25 deer that night. Yeah. And you good balance between bucks and does, but I mean, I don't have a food supply for that. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that's what I think maybe it's more my problem. I was, was beginning to think I had a, a doe to buck ratio problem, but I think I might have a population problem. And that could be. The, the one thing you got to really balance off, off of that as well is, you know, deer are, they're like you and I. We don't eat the same thing every night. And so just because they're all on that field that night doesn't mean there's that same amount of deer in the field next to you. Sure. Right? They, they may be, depends on the time of season, when they're herded up and those types of things. But um, deer like the smorgasbord. They like to, they're, bra- they're gra- uh, grazers by, by habit. So um, it, you could have a little bit of a population issue overall. Um, but, I mean, like out here, there's, there's times that I won't see a single deer. And there's times that they're all in one field. But it depends on the time of year. I mean, like right now you got your bachelor groups up and those types of things. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you may have a little bit of one, but, you know, it doesn't mean that there's that same amount of deer in the field right next to you. And so they just might be all converged at that point for some okay. reason. Okay. Uh, depends <laughs> on what we're, we're blessed in Iowa. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. We're, we're blessed in Iowa to have such an agricultural base yeah. right, that uh, yeah. at least during the summer, you know, it yeah. really is hunting season that uh, when the corn and the beans are picked, right. that the, the supplemental food comes into play. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's one of those things that, to, you know, as you talk about the nutrition and, and, and that type of stuff with the deer is, you know, when we look at doing our food plot stuff, it's, it's a lot of guys want that attractive, you know, for hunting season and stuff like that. But you really got to look at the egg rod around you because really what you're trying to do is complement that. Um, you know, I've got a, a five acre cornfield. I don't want them eating my corn year round. I want them to eat the farmer's corn and That's come right. to mind when he's his pick. Right? <laughs> I, right. I put up signs, but right. for some reason yeah, it doesn't you know, stop. Yeah, them, I know. know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's crazy. Right. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. So, uh, so you talked to you. You've mentioned nutrition quite a bit. Yeah. Um, how do you? What can a landowner do to get the right nutrition for a healthy herd? Yeah, it's uh, it's a fine balance. It's um, and, and I'll go back a little bit. You you do want to complement the the ground around you, uh, and know what's going getting planted around you. Um, uh, 
Because for us, you know, whatever the farmer's planting, I kind of want to plant the opposite of that. Because I want to create that, one, that buffet a little bit so that they have something different to come to. But when I plant my corn and soybeans, I will plant them later. I want them to mature later because... Right now, the deer have their own habits that they're going to eat really what's around you. And so the nutrition, to your point, for Iowa, there's no lack of it. There's a window, though, where there is a lack of it. And that's where you need to kind of think year-round when you're doing your food plots of how to complement that. And so once the, the farmers have harvested their field, there's going to be some remnants for the deer to eat probably for a good 30, 60 days after that. But when that first snow comes around, like end of December, January, February, I mean, really, we sometimes don't get snow now until January or February. So there's always a little something for them to browse on. <clears throat> but I usually complement with my corn and soybeans with a turnip and a radish type of mix um, that I'll plant usually in August. Um, and uh, that allows that to come up. And with radish, with turnip, I should say, uh, Turnip is not really palatable to the deer until that first hard frost. And so it's one of those unique forages for deer that they'll leave it alone. It allows it to grow and do its thing. And a good turnip field will get two, two and a half feet tall. So it'll actually sit above the snow when you do get snow. But once you get that hard freeze for a couple weeks in there, it creates that sugar base in the bulb to come up into the forage. And it just becomes candy candy to them right and that usually happens when there's nothing else for them to eat and so and there's a huge nutrition base to that so that forage (laughs) usually will even stay green through that time so you'll have plenty of nutrition in there they'll have a ton of calcium because it's still green you'll still have plenty of of protein in there to get them through that hard winter time frame especially those mature bucks that have been chasing and they've just they've lost probably you know a good portion of their weight so now there's something there for them to still eat. It's that window here in Iowa that um, when I think nutrition, that's what I'm trying to provide a nutrition balance for is during that period because that's when they need it most because to your point, they, there's plenty for them to eat around here. Until yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. That is true, yeah. That is true. It's always a good reminder. Yeah. yeah. So some good strategies there, you know, as far as, you know, planting something different than what's around you, you know, from a complement perspective. And then also seasonality, uh, putting in something that you're right. going to be able to help the herd get through the tough time. Right. That makes and, sense. And the good thing with radish and turnip is, I mean, it grows in about anything. It Anybody can plant it. I'll tell you, the, the only trick to planting those things is don't overdo it. Yeah. Because like a turnip seed, it's it's as tiny as they come, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you overseed an area... It dictates how big the bulbs will get and how tall the forage will get. So if you, you literally don't need much. I mean, we really we we pro- our ratio when we use that is probably about maybe three and a half pounds per acre of seed. Yeah, it's pretty small. It's really small. But the the farther spaced out it is, the bigger the bulb, the bigger the forage. And so a lot of guys, I think I got to put, I got to you know tons. I saw at the store I got to put twelve to fifteen pounds per acre in. Well, then you get the small bulbs and you get this and you're, and they call them like, why is my stuff not working? Well, you yeah. seed it too much. So yeah. there's a ratio for each one of those plants competing against the other one really. Right? Correct. So they absolutely are. Interesting. Now, how, how important is fertilizing when you plant, plant those, those types of plants? You don't need to. I, I never fertilize them. <laughs> I mean, you could put a little bit in, in there if you wanted to. I'd probably do like a soybean mix, like a 20, 20, 20 type of mix. But mm-hmm. um, I, you know, if you've got any kind of decent soil, it doesn't take much for that stuff to take off. It's it's the easiest stuff to plant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my problem. My soil's and, not very good. Yeah. yeah, I think they're a nitrogen a nitrogen hog. I mean, but um, staying on with the nutrition and the food yeah. plot piece from an NDA standpoint, is there any other you know experimental or or new types of uh, seed or or plants out there that uh, the NDA is experimenting with you know they, they haven't really come out with a lot of different stuff I it, and the challenge is and it's it, you know when you look at an NDA association those types of things a lot of those places are based out of the south and so I've always taken that with a grain of salt that I'm gonna come up with my own type of strategies um, just because a lot of their philosophies are based on what's happened for them and what they've studied for down in the south and that type of stuff so 
that's not a bad thing. I mean, some of that you can transition over into the Midwest, but I always try to do my own stuff. And um, I've been using the turnip, uh, the turnip and the, the radish mix for quite a while. Some of the other things I'll mix in there is uh, there's nothing wrong with doing like some winter wheat. If you put some winter wheat fields out, so that if you don't get a lot of snow, uh, those become pretty popular for the deer as well. Um, there's uh, various winter peas uh, that you can try that work well here or notes. Uh, I've practiced with all of those here in the Midwest and um, I've had some success with all of that. Um, and so uh, those have been my experiences. Um, the NDA hasn't come out with really much of in that perspective, but um, that's kind of what I've had experience with. So I'm planting, I'm going to plant peas this year. Yeah. Uh, it's probably, it's my first time of really kind of going all in. Yeah. Uh, you have any recommendations or watch outs when planting that? Um, well, the, the challenge with it is that it, it's palatable early. Yeah. And so the deer like to wipe it out. Um, and so I've always planted my peas. I've actually planted a mix of peas with oats. Uh, and I've used the Austrian pea because the Austrian pea actually can vine out and kind of spread out a little bit. Okay. Um, and so that's been pretty good, but I've always mixed it with something. But it, I've had, that's been my challenge is it's deer like it early. And so if there's not something else for them to feed and they, they stumble upon it, they'll probably wipe it out. Um, I've actually in some cases planted peas early in the year when I've done, when I've done my corn because the peas will vine up around the corn stalks. Huh. And it creates a little bit of a nice smorgasbord. <laughs> yeah, that's a good wow. idea. Yeah. 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 It's good have you ever taken uh, peas and brassicas and mixed them together? I don't. And the reason for that is, is because your brassicas create, especially your turnips, will create that big umbrella of a, of a, of a, of a forage mm -hmm. and will choke out anything underneath it. Okay. Yeah. I've sometimes used oats because the oats will pop out through and come up, but the peas tend to get choked out. It's a good cover crop. Oats is always in winter wheat. It's a good, yeah. good mixed cover crop, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not to throw you in a different direction. Yeah, no. It's kind of on this topic, uh, nutrition. Um, is there anything you supplement, um, you know, from a lick standpoint or, or uh, you know, nutrients? Um, you know, it's a challenge because uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of using mineral. Um but it's considered baiting here. Yeah, you, yeah. You can't We're talking the off season, right? Right, so. right. Um, I there's a lot of different mineral mixes out there. The, the thing I would tell you, you got to really watch for is that for a mineral mix to be effective, it has to have salt in it because salt is one of the few things that deer actually can crave and will pursue. You still want the mineral mix to be all salt because then it's just a salt block. Sure. And so make. I would just recommend, I don't, I mean, I don't have a preference of a brand, anything like that, but if you're looking for a mineral mix and they are very helpful is, uh, make sure it's got a good proponent of, of the nutrition you're trying to give the deer that it's not just an attractant. Um, but they will all have some form of salt in it because if you just did mineral, the deer would never touch it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And is it the calcium? In uh, calcium, one of the main components for yeah. for uh, antler growth. Yep, yep, it is. Um, and so that's pretty huge. And so your timing of that is is pretty key. Like right now, they're still in velvet. The longer they're in velvet, the more calcium you can get in them, the better. Um, but the, it's the calcium and the protein. You want to get as much protein in them as 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 well in them. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So going back to, I want to go back to NDA here for a second. Yeah. And then we've got some other questions. Sure. So. With the merger of QDMA and NDA, do you foresee any major changes uh, with with the merging of those two entities? Um, not really. I did one of the main things that was a concern, I wanted to make sure from my perspective was that they kept on some of their main biologists, which they've done uh, from the QDMA side. Um, I you know I do get a lot of feedback from them. They are starting to ramp up having events again. They're trying to push to have more banquets to get the educational piece out. Um, but I think you're going to see the same similar format that you've seen in the past. If you've been part of a Whitetail Institute or a QDMA, they're going to see the same type of banquet type of format uh, and those types of things. Um, I think they're going to go back to one of the things that QDMA did is they actually offered a, a steward, stewardship 
uh, conservation stewardship course that you could take. That you could actually go to one of their locations and take this course for two weeks and really learn the nutritional piece, the balance piece. I mean, it's not just food plots and stuff, but even the timber management piece and all those types of things, which are pretty key. Uh, I think they're going to go back to offering those types of classes, um, which are very beneficial. I mean, if you're, a, especially if you're a new property owner, just learning, uh, it might be worth your time to take a week and go down and do one of those types of things because uh, they have some of the best biologists doing those, and it's all in the field type of work. So you're not just sitting in a classroom reading out of a book. They take you to the field and show you how they do those types of things. That's nice. pretty interesting. So I'm really hoping they're bringing those all the way back because those were very beneficial. Um, and so, uh, but I think it's just kind of a gradual effect. Like, like we talked about the merger just took place at the end of 2020. Um, we just started learning more about it at the beginning of this year. And so I think they're still trying to get their feet under them a little bit of, you know, how that's going to lay out and look, but, um, but I, it feels like they're trying to do the right things, which will be good. So playing off what you said about timber management practices as a, as a private landowner, what can I do? to improve the deer habitat from a timber management perspective? Um, well, one of the things that we've done uh, here is uh, in our our property when we bought this, it's, it's got a bunch of the honey locust trees, which are those big thorny things that I absolutely just hate, right? They're miserable to take out. Um, and mind you, we've taken out a bunch of them out of here. Um, but in our thicker timber areas, um, one of the things that we've done is we've, I um, uh, can't think of the terminology, but we've done like a, a partial cut on some of them where they drop. So you've got about a four TSI. foot. TSI? Yeah. yeah. So we've done, we've done some of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll actually, in some of those areas, I've taken hay bales and put them underneath, like spread them out. And you can tell the deer will go and they'll bed in them huh. in those, those areas. So like we'll take a bunch of those old locust trees where they'll cross over and you've got kind of a canopy underneath a little bit underneath well the deer kind of like that little security and so we've thrown some hay bales in some of those and that's worked pretty good i don't, I don't know what it's really done big picture Short wise idea. for us that's first for me that's it, a great it, idea it, though it's uh i don't know what it does for us big picture wise but i i, I know they use it and it's not in locations that you know i'd like to say i have pic trail cam pictures of them but that timber area we stay out of and so i don't have cameras in those spots when that happens but you know, you check out, you know, you'll buy there every once in a while, you'll see something sleeping in it. I don't know. <laughs> so you, it sounds like you leverage a portion of your property as kind of a preserve too. Is that true? Yeah. We create a sanctuary type of, you know, our methodology in certain locations. So we have certain spots that we'll stay out of, you know, pretty much all year. Maybe we'll do some shed hunting in it during certain times of the year. Um, we allocate some of our property for, because uh, there's a couple of us that own it, so we all got to get along, right? Um, there are certain locations that will be non-doe shooting locations. So if we think that that's going to be a popular rut location, we let all the does we want stay in that spot. That's a good idea. And so we have some locations that we want to thin out does, and that may change each year, right? Um, and so, but we do have some locations that will shoot does year-round. We have some locations we're not shooting does here because... Here's where we think the bucks are going to kind of come into, where we have the right doe to buck population, um, and that's worked. We've we've definitely seen in those locations more mature bucks trickling in come November into those spots. And so, yeah. so do you change that year to year? Yeah, it'll rotate a little bit. We have to kind of agree on where we want to do that at. So we all kind of have our own little favorite spots, and but we do share information amongst the three of us. And there's actually two of us that hunt it, but. Um, I mean, we share our information of what we think the best location is. It's not a matter of a favorite spot or not. It's, um, I'll, I I kind of have the, the expertise of what we think the best philosophy is, and they tend to go my way a little bit. But uh, it, I want them all to be successful. I mean, there's more of the partners' deers on the, deer on the wall than there are mine, so I like them to be successful too. But, uh, yeah, it'll change a little bit each year. Yeah. Yeah, just to mention, I mean, so we're shooting this episode – at Terry's and his partner's uh, hunting lodge. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in the background, you'll see, and we don't have them completely on film yet, but we'll, we'll take some additional pictures, but really some great characteristics between all of these, yeah. these animals. And uh, so we'll make sure we put that in there. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a beautiful property. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a weird scenario because we you know, we have quite a bit of acres, but it's deer move so much, right? And we're literally a half an eight, half a mile off of Lake Red Rock, which has got a ton of core ground, right? We rarely see the same bucks each year. Wow. It's almost different bucks. I can tell you it's almost always different bucks every year. And it's you know, if that ground floods, we have a lot more bucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wet fall. Wet fall. It right? doesn't happen all the time. It's happened a couple times, but when it does, it's it's a spectacular year. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <laughs> That's Funny. awesome. Any other, uh, sticking on the, the forestry part of this, yeah. um, any other, uh, you know, hints or tips that you can pass on to us from a habitat standpoint? You know, from a woods? timber perspective, when we bought this place, it was it was loaded with those locust trees. I mean, what, what we're sitting in right now, there was, this whole field was full of locust trees. We spent three years clearing them out. I mean, they're just not good habitat for deer. And then the flip side of that, we planted probably 3,000 hardwoods. Now, if you've ever planted hardwoods, you know that you can plant 3,000. If you get 30, you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the other things that we've done that, that I've added and uh, that it, I'm waiting for it to happen where it, it comes together is that we've started planting more fruit trees. And again, it's like, it's like peas. If you can keep the deer from eating them, they'll be great. Uh, yeah. But we planted some fruit trees, um, and some of those have done well, and some of them we're still trying to protect. But uh, I, I think fruit trees are a huge attractant, maybe not necessarily from a nutritional perspective of, of helping the deer much, but uh, from attractant purposes, deer love fruit trees. <laughs> I had planted a bunch of uh, apple trees very similar, trying to do the same thing. Crab apples, apple yeah. trees. I had this one tree, it was finally on its fifth year, I'm think I'd been protecting it, I'm not going... All right, great. Now I got to make sure I get the pollination. Yeah. And uh, I had this buck come through and rut. And I had, I mean, it's this big around. So I thought, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm just about there. <laughs> shredded it. Yeah. T- completely shredded it. Yeah. I've got mine double fenced. I got T posts kind of jagged around them. <laughs> we'll see. Oddly enough, the, old, the trees that I have that are matured, that are producing fruit, were three trees I got for free probably seven, eight years ago, and they're peach trees. And they're really? probably 30 feet tall, and I'll show them to you guys here later today, but, and the deer don't eat dang peaches. So, <laughs> it's the only tree. Beautiful I, trees. Beautiful trees, <laughs> but, you know, if I get my wife to make peach pie, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's funny. Iowa Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s, Located in historic Kiyosakwa, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. So hey, I want to. Go, so after timber management, so uh, we hear periodically people talk about calling out deer. You know, <laughs> deer, you know, that have, you know, maybe they're perceived don't have the right genetics yeah. from their perspective. What is both NDA and your perspective on that? I, I think we have a perspective on it, but I'd be, I'd be very interested in yours. So uh, my philosophy on calling on, calling on deer. So, um, you know... A, a long time ago, and we talked about this earlier too, is we did some studies on domestic elk herds a little bit just to see what nutrition would do and, and those types of things. Well, you, domestic elk herds also have the DNA tracking, so you can totally compare true DNA across the board. And the one thing we found in them, which I believe is also my philosophy with deer, is that the doe carries a majority of the genetic trait. Um, and so you could shoot a buck that's got a bad, bad genetic trait. And and there are some out there that might be worth shooting, but, um, I don't necessarily believe that that's going to be the driving factor of cleaning out the bad genetic trait within. So if you've got less for simplicity, if you've got a, a trait of drop time, which would be great. If you've got a drop time. If you shoot, 
several of the drop tying bucks that are out there, you haven't impacted the genetic trait because it probably came from the mother. And you'll never really know which mother it was. Right? Yeah. And so when you shoot the does is when you're probably creating the most balance or imbalance of changing the genetic trait in your herd that you're hunting. Um, and so I don't try to get too hung up on the whole calling of a bad buck that's breeding out there because I don't think he overall has a huge impact necessarily. Now, if you've got a bad, if you got a buck out there that's the brute and he's got a terrible trait to him, I'd kill him because it can't hurt to get him out of there. Sure. Right? But you don't necessarily know if that's really what what the changing factor will be. Yep. I, I think I would be aligned with that. I mean, that's where I'm at. I've, I've seen, I, my belief is, is that, uh, you know, just because that deer looks this way, the rack looks this way this year, doesn't mean it's not going to be the same next year. Right. You know, it, it right. could be, we've all seen it right. go from what I call demon bucks, where it's just no forks, just a straight antler. Right. And you know, three years later, you see the same deer and it's a 12 point buck or something. Right. Right. So. Right. It changes. So, yeah. yeah. And I would agree that it, I need to see an, an anomaly with a buck more than one year to hold him hold that against him. Um, Cause if I, if I have a, a buck come by me, that's got a beautiful right side and the left side's kind of jacked up. I'm not going to shoot him because he's a call buck. I'm probably going to let him go because I think he's going to regenerate that correctly the next year. Let, let's see what he looks like next right. year. Right. 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 Yeah. Yep, I, agree. Awesome. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's cool. That's good I don't idea. know if that aligns with what you guys. No, no, no. About. It perfectly aligns. With okay. Me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, on the genetic piece with the elk, is there any? I mean, I'm just curious. Any anything else? Uh, because we're not able to do that except to, like if you're got a fenced in farm or something like that, right. which most people don't. Um, any other things that they're doing really cool things with genetics on the elk side that might um, reapply to the. I've kind of not been part of that industry for quite a while, so they could be doing things that I'm just not aware of. It was it was just a weird opportunity for me that allowed me to to do some things that you couldn't do. There was no other controlled environment like it, um, and so it, I was always thankful for that. It was kind of really informative from my perspective. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, you know the genetic piece of it is it's kind of a, a mystery a little bit. I mean, the only thing I can tell you, and the one thing I learned most going through this why i really lean towards that doe piece is that if you go to an elk auction for domestic herd you know people would want to buy bulls because they were part of this genetic trait or this genetic trait but the smart buyers were buying the right cows so that when there'd be a certain cow that would come in that would go for three or four times the other ones he knew something more that that cow was producing you know a lot more than you know, interesting. Than, interesting. Yeah. So it's huh. it was always the smart buyers were looking for the right cow, not the right bull. Uh, yeah, that's smart. <laughs> smart. Yeah. So we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up diseases in the whitetail population, yeah. right? So um, I think we need to talk about. I mean, certainly CWD is one of them. Yep. Um, what's the NDA's perspective on these diseases? How can we help the landowners? Um, help to keep these diseases off their property and out of their out of their deer population. I will tell you the NDA um, and I, I, I don't have information on it now, but I know they're doing some studies this year on CWD uh, to try and figure out the best way to combat that. It's 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 a challenge across the board. Um, I mean and from our perspective, we've been fortunate not to run into it here, but it hasn't been that all that far south of us. That no. doesn't concern me. So it's creeping, yeah, yeah, it's creeping, and so it's it's one of those weird, weird things that's been around quite a while. Now, um, they, they they're trying to help figure it out. I mean, inevitably, you can't really test for it unless the animal's dead. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to get beyond that so you can kind of figure out what's going on in the herd and that type of stuff? And so, um, uh, they I, I think there's probably more to come on that. Sure. Um, but, you know, CWD was uh, a big factor in the elk industry for quite a while. And sure. there's actually a rumor where CWD actually came from was from those domestic type of herds. And so um, I, I won't get on the whole political track of, of that, um, but, uh, but uh, it, it, inevitably it's here. And so 
I think as, as conservationists, we've got to all kind of figure it out and, and do what we need to do to figure that out. You know, so, so as a landowner, is there, uh, is there anything that we haven't asked you that, uh, that we should be asking you with regards to what they can do from a deer habitat perspective that you'd want to leave them with? You know, it's, uh, it, again, in Iowa, it's, we're pretty blessed. <laughs> Um, from a nutrition perspective, we, we don't have that many months of, of lacking of nutrition for the deer. Uh, as a state, we've got some of the best genetics in the country. I mean, it's just, I think we're just blessed to have that, uh, cause I've hunted all over and, uh, there's nothing like home for me, but, <laughs> um, but you know, there's just, uh, you know, the one thing I would tell people is, is as we look at the conservation side and I go back a little bit more on the camaraderie piece mm -hmm. um that there's more to this than just killing the animal and having two kids both of them you know i have a boy and a girl they both have grown up hunting uh and there's just memories you can't take away from that and so uh some of us like to hunt for trophies those types of things the trophies in the mind of the beholder so like when my daughter comes out i don't care what she shoots she can shoot She's the only one I'll allow to shoot something with spikes on if she wants to because she's spending time with me. Uh, my son's a little bit pickier. He's been doing a lot. He does a lot more than, than she does. But, you know, uh, don't take away, don't make a trophy hunt something that can't be more of a memory, you know, spending time with family and those types of things. And so from an Iowa, from our perspective, I we're blessed. We got some of the best habitat. And uh, I think our DNR does a great job. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so it's we're pretty lucky. <laughs> okay. You know, he brings up, I mean, when we think about, I mean, my some of my best moments is around that camaraderie. Yeah. Right? So I've done a few elk hunts. Some of my best, there's, I didn't harvest an animal until my third hunt. And I would tell you my first two had great experiences. Uh, hunting with a dear friend. Uh, one was a stake camp, 6,000 feet horseback riding oh, nice. and, uh, just a tremendous hunt. Um, and I, I never harvested an animal yeah. and, uh, doesn't matter. Right. And, uh, so I agree with that. Uh, so I, I appreciate you bringing that back to, you know, yeah. the center because that's really what it's all about. It really is. It really is. I mean, our, some of my best two hunts are my son and I will do hog hunts in Georgia and I've yet to get a hog. But I love those trips. This is one of my favorite trips in the world. Hmm. It is. It is fun uh, to to be around other folks that with like minded and yeah. just just to be around uh, yeah. hunters is, is special. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I'm gonna reloop back just on deer surveys. Sure. Is there anything from an NDA standpoint or your experience? Um, I mean, is there any? format that you're using to to gather this information from a survey standpoint or is it pretty much informal it's it's fairly informal i mean it's um again you can get a lot of good education from nda um on their website because they've moved all the qdma stuff over to that um where if you're looking to do various studies if, if you know you can even send their biologists an email and say hey i'm trying to figure this out they'll email you back they'll call you They'll talk you through it. I mean, that's all part of uh, of their their mission is to help you out and do those things. You know, like we talked about earlier, there's not necessarily a, a, a independent person that can come out and evaluate your land. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of manpower to make something like that happen. But they are very readily available either by email or by phone um, to talk you through some of those things um, to get you the information you want, but you just got to call and tell them, Hey, here's what I'm looking to do. Here's what I'm experiencing. They'll help you out. They're, they're great about all that. That's yeah, great. That's great. Re great resource. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, excellent. So, Hey, I want to, we're starting to wind down here. I, I noticed you're wearing a Reconyx yeah. shirt. Uh, I don't, neither of us own one of those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and probably most of our listeners probably don't have one of those, but I've always wanted to know, I mean, are they that great? Are they? Tell us a little bit about them. So, uh, yeah. So I, I've uh, I've been affiliated with Reconyx through a different partnership I've got and stuff, and uh, uh, from one of the hunting shows we do, and it's um, uh, it's a great camera. It's uh, you know, obviously it's more expensive, 
Um, but they do have, I mean, so first off, they have the lifetime warranty. So if you ever have an issue, they just send you a new one, wow. which is no matter how old, <laughs> silly cameras. So it's, uh, um, you know, as we talked about, I think the quality is a lot better. They're definitely longer lasting. Um, we've used them for hunting shows to where, well, if you've got the cam- the video part on, you can incorporate that video into a normal show you see on the outdoor channel or pursuit channel. And it's just as good as the cameras we're using to film the, the, the hunt. And so the quality is spectacular. Um, we don't run into too much of, uh, the other thing we talked about is the 3,000 pictures of the grass going back oh, and yeah. forth in front of your camera. Um, they, uh, the sensitivity is spectacular on them. And so uh, they they are the better camera. It's not, it's, it's a higher price tag, but you are getting a much better camera than I think than most. And I've used pretty much all of them. So, <laughs> so that's awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I think you hand that uh, shirt to not. Thank you. So, hey, as part of our thank you to you, uh, you know, we have a sponsor, um, new sponsor with Nose Jammer that we've, we've talked about. And I uh, want to give you one of those cans. I, we've talked just before we went on, and uh, yeah. um, we are huge supporters, not because they're a sponsor of ours. But we have an episode out there, as we talked earlier. It's called Stinky Hunting. Highly recommend it. Uh, um, Not hunting. Stinky. But highly recommend watching the episode. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And uh, the product works. Um, awesome. It, it really works. And uh, I am not afraid to go out into my tree stand if the wind's the wrong direction. And because that's where I want to hunt. Uh, that night. Well, you've talked to me into it. I'm gonna give it a try. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> it. Here's a shirt. Uh, Great. I always like shirts from Midwest Hunting and Outdoors, Thank and you. Uh, hopefully it's as comfortable as the one it that you have. Like <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank do you, you have anything else, Joel? No, I'm good. I just want to thank you again, Terry, for allowing us to. One, see your property yeah. and uh, spend some time with us today. Share your knowledge. Yeah, not a problem. Place. I appreciate it. Appreciate Beautiful place. Uh, so with that. Be safe, Safe, have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be be safe, safe, have have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors.